Morning, everyone. Good to see you here today. Listen, I want to tell you about something. Maybe you saw this in the news if you're old enough uh, about 30-some years ago. It was uh, flight 254 of uh, Varig flight, uh, Brazilian flight, that left from Sao Paulo all the way up to a city in northern Brazil called Belém. Belém is a northern coastal city, um, and this flight took place over the course of 12 hours. It was a pretty standard flight. It was something that they did almost every single day. But because they didn't have enough uh, routes going at this time in Brazilian Air Force history, they, they had to make a number of stops. So anytime you went from its largest southern coastal city to its largest northern coastal city, you had to endure six stopovers. Six. How would you like to have to do that? And most of these stopovers took place somewhat into the interior of the country as you go a little bit into the Amazon. And so the pilots of this flight were doing their normal northern route, making the different stopovers along the way. As they got to the last stopover, the final one, you can imagine the exhaustion, right? You've been flying already most of the day. You just want to get moving as fast as possible so you can get to your end destination and call it quits. You can call yourself a day and have a little bit of a break. So they get to this place. But the sad reality is, is that flight 254 will never make it to its end destination of Belém. It will crash land into the Amazon forest. And you have to ask yourself, how did this even happen? How do you get so off route from what you were planning to do? Well, they did some investigations and came to realize that there was a perfect storm of issues. The first issue was this, is that the uh, pilot and the co-pilot did not follow procedure. You see, any time that you stop, there's a number of things you have to do. There's a checklist of things you have to do any time you land, any time you take off. It might seem monotonous, but it's one of those things that they require absolutely you do so that things are done safely. One of the things is that when you're inputting the codes for the destination into the flight computer, both people have to be there to see it and double check that that was done. That procedure was not followed because there's also some exterior examinations that need to happen on the, fl on the plane itself. So the pilot and the co-pilot say, hey, let's get this going as fast as possible. Kill two birds with one stone. The pilot said, I'll input the information. You go take a look at the exterior of the plane so we can leave a few minutes earlier. So that's perfect storm number one. Perfect storm number two is that the uh, pilot received the code and the code was 0270. And what the pilot thought that meant was that they needed to set a destination at 27 uh, degrees. And what they actually needed to put in was 270 degrees. Uh, see, what had happened is, is he had been on vacation a few weeks before, and so they changed the system from a three-digit to a four-digit uh, code uh, system to put into the computer while he was away on holiday and no one informed him about this change and so when he receives the code and he sees 0270 he thinks that's funny I've never seen a zero in front of this before but because it's three that it must be 27 degrees not 270 degrees and so instead of going you know due north they ended up going uh, considerably due west in this so that's perfect storm number two it was this final leg was only supposed to be about 50 minutes and it's nighttime and so as they're flying they call into the radio tower but there's nothing but static that's kind of odd they've never had this problem before they try a few other channels till eventually they are able to figure out that the tower is able to receive them and the tower in Belém was an old tower it was still not up to 20th century standards. And one of the issues that they didn't have was they still didn't have radar at this. But they did know this. There was no one in their airspace. Everyone who was supposed to have taken off and landed had done so a long time ago. So he goes ahead and says, you have no one in your airspace. So you can start your final descent, not knowing that he is nowhere near them. The pilot starts to go down. He starts to descend. And he finds it odd that he can't see any lights, right? It's, it's like, it's dark out, it's night, but you should be able to see lights. He calls in, radios in again and says, was there a major power outage? I, I don't see anything. He gets low enough that he can kind of make out the terrain and he realizes he is way off course. There's no ocean, there's no city, there's a sporadic bit of lights that make up villages, tiny hunting villages within the Amazon. And, 
and they realize they're way off course, but perfect storm number four is that they didn't refuel at their last station like they were supposed to, and so when he starts to reroute himself, first of all, he doesn't even know which way to go. Secondly, he doesn't have enough fuel to make it, and so he realizes one way or another they're going to be having to have a crash landing. The end story here is that 12 people will tragically die. Amazingly, 40 people will survive this crash landing in the middle of the Amazon. They will be there for days until eventually two of them will take off on a trek, find a hunting party that has a radio, and they will be rescued later on that week. But it was one of these things that as they investigated and they looked at the scenario, the human failure that happened by many parties in this issue, Fundamentally, what it came down to wasn't about the operating system. The, the plane flew just as it was supposed to, and it did it have enough fuel? Well, in the tank, yeah, it should have had enough fuel. It wasn't any of those mechanical problems. This wasn't a problem with Boeing, right? This, this was human failure. This was because fundamentally they got started, and they continued on the wrong route until they eventually crash-landed. I tell you this story for this reason. Because I believe that one of the conditions for humanity is that we oftentimes start off on a destination for life and, and we end up going toward the wrong route, right? How many of us have set our destination for some vague thing called the good life, right? The good life, that's the route we're going to go for. I used to live in the U.S. and we called it the American dream. It was like, you, you can have all of the good stuff, right? Life's going to be hunky-dory going forward, but we know that life sometimes throws you curveballs. And that when you follow a route that says, I'm going for the good life, when I'm chasing popularity or happiness, whatever that means, or, or, or pleasure or, or finances, and, and trying to make myself somebody that oftentimes... The end destination can leave you like you've been crash landed somewhere and you don't even know the destination you are anymore. Some of us, we follow something called religion. Well, that's getting a little closer, but actually when you think about it, that's as far away from the route that you're supposed to go because most religions, most man-made religions that we look at in the world, they have this concept of right and wrong. It's moralism, and I don't mean morality, I mean Moralism as a, as a system, as a religion in itself, it's, it's where you are like looking at the good things that you do in life, weighed up against the bad things you do in life, and you say, well, I'm generally a good person, and so if, as long as I follow this course for my life, I, 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 I think that's leading me in the right route. And the problem with moralism is what is considered right and what is considered wrong is changing Every other day, the beliefs of what used to be considered wrong 10 years ago are now considered right. And I hate to tell you this, but 50 years from now, some of your grandchildren and great-grandchildren are going to hold, look at some of the beliefs that you held today with horror because moralism is shifting sand. There, there is no definitive, at least from a cultural standpoint, of what is solid, right? Like this is... This is moralism, and, and what moralism does is it, it, it just compares. It's like, I'm good, I'm better than this person, right? And so as long as I'm better than this person, you know, like, yeah, I've, I've done some wrong things, but, but I'm not a monster, right? And what that fails to account for is this germ, this disease, that seed inside each and every one of us that even causes us to become people like that or to do some of the things that we regret in our life. See, there was this system in the Bible that many people followed. It was this system called the law. Maybe you've heard the term Torah. Uh, it was this Jewish system. In fact, the faith of Judaism still follows, by and large, this system to this day. You'll find it in the Old Testament. And it was 613 individual laws and later into the time of Jesus, you'll find that there are a whole bunch of extra laws added to these 613 laws so that you don't even get close to breaking these laws. And, and so like Christian, or not Christian, but excuse me, uh, religious moralism when it came to the Bible was about looking at these rules, right? As long as you don't cross that boundary, as long as you don't step over that line. But here's the problem with what the law was intended for. You see, the law was intended to inform. It was to show us, this is in bounds, this is out of bounds, 
And these are the consequences when you step out of bounds. The problem with the law, if you're holding to that as a sort of like, okay, this is the route I need to take in life. This takes me to a destination where I land safely, is that if you break any of the laws, you've broken the law. And anytime you've broken the law, there is nothing you can do. There is nothing you can pay within yourself, within your goodness, within your systems that will be able to make up for those things. The Bible tells us that there is this thing that we have diminished in our world today called sin. And sin is powerful. Make no bones about it. The wrongs of the world today, the heinous things you see in the world, the problems you see in the world, the tragedies, the wars, the diseases, the, the oppressions. There are more slaves today in the world today than any other, part of the, any other time in human history. Most of them are little girls and most of them are sl sold into sex slavery. How does that happen in the 21st century? It is sin. And I hate to tell you this. The Bible tells us that you were born into that. That the same disease that affects those who do these terrible, oppressive, wicked things exists inside of you. Sin is so powerful that any time you break one law, you've broken the law. What Rachel brought last week as we've been going through this series on the book of Romans, and I know she probably came with a whole lot of enthusiasm. I know my wife. And what she brought to us last week is God's rescue plan. It's this exciting, it's, what, it's the gospel. It's, what we, it's why we gather. It's, why we put, it's, it's what we put our trust, it's what we, it's what we live for. And so we're going to continue in this series in Romans 3 because what or excuse me, Romans 4, because what Rachel brought to us last week is that the plan, the rescue plan to get us from this terrible, oppressive thing called sin is Jesus. It's the good news. See, in the time of the New Testament, when Romans was written, Paul, the writer of this letter, he's writing to a group of Christians in the largest city of its day, Rome. He didn't found the church. In fact, he had never been to the church. He'd never met these these Christians, but like every other major city in the Roman emperor, Empire, most churches began with groups of Jewish Christians. Paul was Jewish. He went to his community to preach the gospel first. You do the same thing, right? If you're a part of like a Rotary Club and you just discovered the greatest thing in the world, you're going to go tell your friends at the Rotary Club, right? Your family, you're going to tell those people you know first. So this is how the church kind of started. They were almost entirely Jewish Christians. But over the next couple decades, a crazy thing happened. Individuals who had been following paganism all of a sudden saw the virtues and the freedom and the liberty and the life that Jesus Christ brings in the gospel. And they said, I want what they have. And so there began to be this intermixing of Jews and Gentiles where before it had never happened. Here was the problem that started to emerge, is that these Jewish Christians over here started to say, you know what, yeah, like Jesus is the route, the route we should be taking, but so is the law, right? Like we still follow the law, like we still eat kosher, we, we try not to break the laws, we, they're good guides for us. And so what you need to do, Gentile brothers and sisters, is you need Jesus and the law, which means you need to get circumcised. Which, which means you need to become essentially Jewish. And what Paul writes, and as we've already looked at the series in chapter 1, 2, and 3, is one, we all have this thing called sin. Two, the law cannot ever lead us, ever lead us to a thing where we are saved, where we have experienced that liberty, that freedom that we're talking about. And that the same problems that existed with pagan Gentiles before they ever came to Christ really still exists with these Jewish Christians, and that Jesus is the rescue plan. So the question for today, which was the question that was on the minds of many Jewish and Gentile Christians as they were intermixing, like, okay, Paul, give us finally, what is it? How do we get this thing? How do we get Jesus? How do we get the rescue plan? What is the route we need to take is what he's going to talk about here in chapter 4, verse 1, starting there of the book of Romans. It will be on the screen behind me. If you don't have it there, um, check in your Bible, and we will continue on. Verses 1 through 4, and then down to 16, Romans 4, it says this. What then shall we say? 
that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter. If, in fact, Abraham was justified by his works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. Skip down to verse 16. It says this. The promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, not only those who are of the law, but those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. Stories told of a woman in Georgia named Terry Logan. Terry Logan was the single mother of two children. One of her children was born premature and had a number of medical issues. She, had a ve- she was a, a teacher's aide in the state, didn't have much education, didn't have a husband or a family to support her, and the medical bills she racked up were so immense, she knew she would never, I mean never, be able to pay them back. For 10 years, she lived through the amount of stress and anxiety attacks of continuing to receive those debts with the interest being added on and added on and the constant debt collectors sending notes and calling in and She knew that she had only enough to be able to manage her life and raise these two children. All of a sudden, one day, after 10 years of enduring this nightmare, she receives another letter from another agency, but this one she didn't understand. In fact, she at first thought it was spam mail. It was called RIP Medical Bills. She took out the letter. She opened it after avoiding it for a number of days, and she looked on there, and she realized that on this note it was saying that the medical statement that she was being left with was zero. She couldn't believe it. She thought it was fake. She called up. She looked online to see if this was legit or some cruel prank. But what she came to realize is that, no, her medical debt had been completely wiped out. She didn't apply for it. Someone else didn't apply for it for her. It was just covered once and for all. When she called the agency to learn more about this organization and ask, why did this happen? How did this happen? She learns this thing, that this organization started by Christians was all about raising funds to be able to take long-standing debts and wipe them out. And how they did this was uh, kind of working around the system of debt collection. You see, what happens with debt collectors is when you receive debt, and the debt collectors look at your situation, and they look at your funds and finances, they're able to see, I'm probably not going to be able to collect this debt with what they make. And so they wait, hoping their situations will change. But after a while, what they end up doing is they sell that debt to another debt collection agency for half of what it is. And when they sell to this organization, they're going to hope against hope, now that they've got a steal, that they can, again, wait for the situation to change and be able to make double back what they made. But what happened with Terry and what happened with hundreds of thousands of Americans today is they sell it not once or twice, but four or five times until literally the debt that is being collected is pennies on the dollar. What this organization does is it comes in and it assesses a debt that is hundreds of thousands of dollars that has now been whittled down to a few thousand dollars and they buy it and wipe it out once and for all. This organization has wiped out $6.9 billion of medical debt by only about 20 million donors, $20 million donations. That's kind of the sense of what I feel like when I look at what Paul's writing about here. What it's like to, what it's like about to, to get this thing called grace. Oh, don't you love the word grace? It's one of those words I have such a hard time mentally getting my mind around. I don't deserve it. I could never pay it back. And yet, through the rescue plan of Jesus Christ, When he took your sin and my sin upon the cross once and for all, representing all of humanity's baggage, he defeated it. He conquered it by raising from the dead. And now for you and I, who've been covered by his blood, who have said yes to his rescue plan, it's gone. Imagine that woman, the liberty, the wash of anxiety, the new future, like a whole new future. Not only for herself, but her her family going forward. That's what grace is all about. And it's what Paul writes about here. 
Paul says, hey, when you work a job and you get something, when you get pay, you didn't receive that as a gift. You earned it, right? But there are some things that you can never earn. It doesn't matter how hard you work, what kind of job you have, what kind of setup you have. The only way you can receive something is through a gift. The power of grace is also tragically the greatest reason many people don't receive God's grace. It's because it's free. And we don't like anything in which we have to receive something freely, do we? I've told this story before, but I think it really highlights what I'm trying to illustrate here. Before I moved back to Canada, when I moved to the Lower Mainland about six years ago, I was in between pastoral appointments. And because the hiring season had by and large left me, I knew I was going to have to wait better part of a year before I could step back into my job. And my job is my calling. It is, it's not just a career. It's, it's who I am. And I, I just felt lost. And I lived in New York, and I lived in a part of New York where you know, the economy wasn't very strong. And so I was working a number of odd jobs to help try and provide for my family. But I just simply wasn't making it. So not only was I feeling the sense of being lost because I couldn't do the thing I felt God had been calling me to do, I couldn't even provide for my family. And what ended up happening is I had people in my life who helped identify, here's a place that's low rent. I've talked to the person. They're going to bring the rent down even lower so that you guys can make it. Here are some things that will help you through this process. You can use our car. And I hated every second of it. Because I, like, I, I'm a man. I, I want to provide for my family. right? I remember we were meeting with our small group. And every year, a small group at Christmas time would come up with what we called a Christmas project. We would raise funds throughout the fall because we thought, what is some missional thing? What is some community thing we can give back to, right? And we'd come up with a few thousand dollars, and it was just a way to bless a needed area. I thought that Christmas they had decided not to raise the money and do the project, by and large, because they knew we didn't have any money to give. But we came to our Christmas party to find out that, indeed, they had been collecting money for a Christmas project. We were that project. They said, Chris, you need this right now. And I'm going to tell you something. This is so humbling because I'm a pastor. I'm, supposed to, hey, I'm the one who gives. I'm the one who serves, right? You know what this is like, don't you? You're the one who gives. You're, hey, if we need to help out, if we need to you know, pull things together, if we need to fight, if we need to, you're that person, aren't you? You know what the humbling, hardest thing to do sometimes is? Is to receive. Here's the thing with a gift. You can't earn it. A gift can only be received. And that's the tragedy and the beauty of grace in the same. We all, I don't care what family you're from, I don't care how long you've been a believer, I don't care how much money you give, I don't care how much service you give, I don't care how much you read the Bible, how much you pray, you are nothing without grace. Because grace is Jesus Christ's blood shed for you and over you. That is the route, folks. But you have to receive it. And the tragedy is some of us have a very, very hard time receiving, don't we? We don't like to be in need for anything. The way Paul says you receive God's grace is through this powerful thing called faith. And so what Paul does in this story is he illustrates it by telling the story of a man named Abraham. Abraham, I cannot highlight enough how important he would have been to the Jewish mind. He was the founder not only of their faith, but he was the founder of their whole ethnic personhood. And they show the virtues of what it was to be Abraham, but what they show is not what Abraham did, but, but what Abraham was and how he received grace. And so I'm actually going to read from Genesis 15. And it's at this part in the Genesis story where God has revealed himself to this person in the middle of history about 4,000 years ago named Abram. And he tells him to go. He doesn't even tell him where to go. He goes to a new land, a land that will eventually be Israel. And he says, someday your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And I have a plan to rescue the world that will ultimately be fulfilled through Jesus through your descendants. The problem was is that Abraham was an old dude way past the age of bearing children. He didn't have any children in his life. His wife was old. 
He didn't know how this was going to happen. And he'll try to fidget with this a number of times. He's tried to put it into his, his nephew who leaves him and, and his servant. And he even tries to manufacture his son through a servant girl. And all the way, God says, that's not my plan. That's not my plan. That's not my plan. Just stay laser focused on me. And the Bible tells us here in chapter 15, verse 1, this. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will have to be my heir. But then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is of your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and he said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to them, so shall your offering be. And this is the key verse right here. Abram believed the Lord. He underlined, believed the Lord. And he credited it to him as righteousness. He believed. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Believing is beyond significant here. Abraham is beyond old. He's waited already from God's initial call 25 years, and yet still he does not have the promise fulfilled in his life. He is thinking that maybe he heard voices in his head. Maybe he had a bad dream. You can imagine his servants and his family and his wife looking at him going, Abram, are you sure that you're sure that you're sure? And here God comes exactly when he needs him to, and he tells him, just trust me. What faith is, folks, is it's a transfer of trust. Especially when it doesn't seem to make sense. There's this awesome story Billy Graham told in one of his sermons where this missionary went to Papua New Guinea and he immersed himself with one of the villages, a a unique population that had a unique language. And this individual spent 12 years, 12 years learning the language just so that they could translate one book of the New Testament into their language. He worked four years doing this, but he had one word. He couldn't quite convey how to say it in their language. It was the word faith, trust. How do you do that? So he came up with this idea. He said, he used the word wait. What faith is, is it's wait. When I walk up on this stage, I know I'm gaining weight, but, you know, it's built sturdy. I I trust that the weight of my person is going to hold me up, right? If I walked up on the stage like this, you're not really trusting that that thing is going to be able to hold you up. What faith is, is you're putting your whole weight behind something. Some of us, when it comes to faith, we sort of like, aren't we doing this a little bit? We, we, We believe God, sort of. But what God says, and what the story so powerfully illustrates here, is that faith lived out as a trust transfer where you put your whole weight behind something. When God calls you to something, and you still haven't had it come true. When he gives you a new destiny, when he gives you a new name, a new characteristic, When God gives you something and in the midst of your pain or promises something and in the midst of your pain and doubt, you're still waiting for God to show up. What faith looks like is the story of Abraham where even though it hasn't happened and even though it doesn't make sense and even though it defies all logic, Lord, I trust you. That's what faith is. You don't earn salvation. You don't earn grace. But you get grace when you put your faith behind what God's word says. Jesus Christ, Son of God, crucified for you and I, risen from the dead, and one day coming to establish his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. When you believe that, putting your weight, that's what grace is. It is a trust transfer. To credit something is to confer a new status on something. When you put your weight behind what God promises, he confers this grace, this gift to you, but also a new status. You are no longer defined by the sin you were born into. 
you are defined as a son or daughter of the Most High King. When God looks at you, he does not see your sin. He sees Christ. That, oh, that should to this day make us stand up and shout hallelujah. That is what our faith is all about. That his righteousness, his goodness, his grace, his holiness is now on you. And that you just have to receive it by putting your whole weight into the promises of God. When I was in college, and I started to date my wife, she noticed there were a whole bunch of quirks that she knew she had to undo about me. One of the quirks was how I ate cereal. I love cereal. Love it. Isn't there no perfect bedtime snack than cereal? Some of you eat it in the morning. I think that's crazy. You've got to eat it at night. It's the perfect snack before you go to bed. I love ice cold milk with my cereal. But one thing I hate about cereal is when it gets soggy. I mean, I hate soggy cereal. Some of you guys, you put your cereal, then your milk in, you go and do a chore and come back because you want it soggy. That, that, that's wrong. You want to talk about something that needs grace, that needs grace, okay? Uh, cereal needs to be crispy, right? It, it, the, the milk needs to hit it as soon as you're eating. So what I would do for years is I would, I'd get my bowl, I'd get my milk, I'd get my spoon, I'd put the cereal in the bowl, I'd pour the milk in, I'd eat it as fast as I could, but I could only get through about half of it because I realized what was happening is it getting too soggy for me. So to mitigate this, because I was in college and most of the food that I ate in college was not really edible, you've been in that experience if you've been in college, I ate a lot of cereal in substitution for the meals I was supposed to be having. Rachel's sitting with me one day at dinner time, and I'm eating, you know, Rice Krispies, and I bring two bowls, and this was the process I had. I had two bowls. One bowl was filled with Rice Krispie. The other bowl was half full of ice-cold milk, and I had two spoons. I had a normal spoon, and I had a soup spoon. So what I would do is I'd take the soup spoon, and I'd get the Rice Krispies, and take the normal spoon, and get some milk, and then I would pour it onto the soup spoon, and then pop it in my mouth as quickly as possible. That's the only way it could be crispy in the way I liked it. And she's looking at me going, who is this person I agreed to date, right? Like, I got a lot of work, right? And so she goes, Chris, what are you doing? And I go and explain how I hate soggy cereal, and this is the only way to mitigate that whole problem. And she goes, Chris, why don't, why don't you just get a glass of milk and just spoon cereal and take a drink? And I went, I realized I'd been doing stuff backwards for so long. And that I made it so complicated. It's such, such a ridiculous, complicated system just to eat cereal. <laughs> I think about our spiritual lives and what it means to live this Christian life. I just see so many Christians, they're not living in freedom. Like they come to church, they do religious practices. You might even read your Bible, you might have even been baptized. But you still feel like there's this system you've got to work through to get to the end destination. The right route is all these works you have to do to receive. Not only are you doing it backwards, you're making it so complicated on your life. And what I'm here to tell you is that the good news of Jesus Christ, the rescue plan, is all about receiving. You receive through faith by putting your weight on the promises of God. And then you live in liberty. As we close off this message, I'm just going to invite Russell to lead us in one more song. But I want to speak to three groups of people here really quickly. The first group is the proud group. You're the group who, you know, you've looked kind of at your religious experience and you know that Jesus Christ has saved you and you've accepted it all, but you can't help but, but sort of look your nose down at other people who haven't processed the way you should. It's this old belief that is you have to behave before you believe or belong, right? You get what I'm saying? These people, I'm here to tell you, to remind you here today, you have done nothing to earn your salvation. Nothing. You have simply received the free grace of Jesus' blood over your life. And that this is a day, maybe for some of you, where you need to confess and repent of your attitude. That it's not me, it's him. And these are my brothers and sisters. Here's the second group. It's the anxious group. You're the group who, in spite of hearing a message like this, you're going, yeah, but, yeah, but. 
Chris, if you knew what I did, if you knew what I struggled with, if you knew the skeletons in my closet, and I'm here to remind you that some of the heroes of our faith, those who have received God's grace over their life are people like Peter who denied Jesus and Moses who was a murderer and Paul who was a persecutor and and David who was an adulterer. Every single one of these individuals don't deserve any of God's grace and yet they receive God's grace because they receive it in faith. There is nothing, hear me, there is nothing you have done that cannot be forgiven and redeemed because that is the nature of the God we follow. The last group I want to talk to is the uncertain group. You know, unlike the anxious group, you're, you're not sure that you've ever even received this gift. And maybe you've gone to church for your whole life. But you're, you're just not certain. i got to tell you something. There's no perf- better time to know that you know that you know that you know that you are right with God. Not because of what you do or who you are, but because of your faith by receiving that beautiful gift that still brings salvation to all of us. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask everyone to bow their heads as we get ready to go into this last song. And no one's going to be looking around. But I'm going to ask everyone respect this time. And I'm just going to ask that if you're here today and you're like, oh, I just, I'm not certain. And maybe you feel those butterflies in your stomach and you're trying to like justify or mentally, you know, move that out of your system. This is just emotionalism at play. Don't listen to that. That might be the Spirit of God convicting you for the first time of this need to have something called sin dealt with in a way that only he can through the power of his grace. And so if you're here today, no eyes looking around, but just raise your hand really quickly, really quickly if you just need that. Hmm. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the power of your grace and the reminder that there's nothing that we've done to earn this, but that the rescue plan of God embodied in the person of Jesus Christ and received through the free gift of our faith is so beautiful. It's a message many of us have heard many times before, but we are like children who constantly need reminders of how costly this gift was, how beautiful this gift is, And that even though we might be facing circumstances and situations that we cannot understand and that cause us pain and that cause us even maybe doubt, that we can still today put our weight behind your word because your word brings life. And so, Lord, we ask that you would pour that same spirit over our lives that we know. May this give us a renewed excitement about the rescue plan, a renewed sense that our faith is not just for us, but it is for the whole world. That because when God now looks at us, he sees Jesus, we need to live out the rescue plan of Jesus by bringing this message, not works, but message to a world that so desperately needs to hear it to receive the liberty and freedom that only Christ can bring. God, do this work and renew us and remind us of how beautiful you are. We ask this in the power and the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.